Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Dr. Winter, for that uh, long introduction. Um, but I am excited to be here, not only because of Microsoft's great partnership uh, in the Cascadia Innovation Corridor and the importance uh, to that partnership to the company. I'm also, as someone who spends time in education, and I get a chance in my role to travel to about 30 to 40 countries a year talking to education leaders and ministers. And I would have to say, and for those of you who do not already know it, Canada's education system is one of the most respected globally. It's one of the best national treasures that this great country has. Uh, and it's something that is often a point of reference and hope for countries around the world looking to change. And I'm excited to have a context or a foundation around the role education can and must play with the innovation discussions, the technology discussions that will be happening at the BC Tech Summit. It's an important dialogue as we see the world around us changing, the role of technology growing, not only in our personal lives, but in the workplace, how we keep the world safe, how do we solve problems for the future. And technology is going to be a conversation and a topic throughout, and I'll mention technology certainly through my talk uh, this morning. But I wanted to shift and start with mindset. And I can tell you, as someone who's visited more than 1,000 schools in more than 60 countries, Mindset is everything. It's what the foundation for change needs to be, not only in our education system, but how we transform economies, how we transform workplace. Mindset starts by how do we shift the expectation of every learner? The reality is, in most countries, in most parts of the world, and I would argue in many parts of Canada, students, because of their economic conditions, because of how rural they are and disconnected from cities, maybe even because of their gender. They don't walk into schools expecting that they can, must, and should have a meaningful role in changing the world. They don't see a limitless potential and future for themselves. Teachers have a closed mindset about their role, maybe thinking their role is diminished because of the arrival of technology, when the opposite is absolutely true. So we've got to think differently. This is something that at Microsoft, we've embraced lots of the work that Carol Dweck and Stanford University has done on growth mindset has been foundational to our transformation. And I will pivot throughout my talk this morning about the role of mindset to shift expectations, to think differently about how we can embrace this opportunity that we're all living in with technology transformation. When I go to schools around the world, we talk about this great transformation it doesn't feel great, unfortunately, for lots of educators because they see it as either putting pressure on them as, a, as, as an educator, maybe removing their need and value in the classroom. The reason why this great transformation is taking place, and it is global, I will tell you that the conversations, the narrative, the buzzwords around this transformation, not only in the economic dynamics but in education, are similar regardless of the country you go to. And one of the things that's become more clear in the last several years in my travels and work in education is that there's a recognition that education is the engine for economic growth and development. And in this new fourth digital industrial revolution, one of the things that has fundamentally changed in the other three industrial revolutions is that in this new digital economy, people don't go to find jobs, jobs find people. And when you have talent and you have an educated population of students and workers leaving institutions to find jobs, to create jobs, economic development and prosperity happens. And it can happen globally. And so there's a lot of pressure on this transformation. The thing that what schools and many, many universities often forget is that the transformation has already taken place. This is not a, a transformation that is going to be equal to how many computers or devices that you buy or how much digitization of textbooks that you do. It's a fundamental shift of how we think about the reality of the three most important things that any education system can hope to change. The first would be the actual mindset of kids, students. We know today students think differently about themselves, their role in the world. They use technology and physical reality seamlessly. We, we call this generation of students fidgetal. And they don't see a difference between their digital reality, whether they consume digital devices, collaboration, et cetera, and the world that they live. 
That's something that is, is, is becoming natural to them. They also, because of that technology, see their place in the world differently and increasingly want to be responsible, connect uh, globally to issues, uh, and be purposeful with what they're doing. And that's going to become a pervasive th theme throughout the transformation that we need in education. We know that the way these students learn is different. This is true for all of us as well. How we share ideas, share information, how we create content, how we get access to a globally expanding, exponentially expanding uh, re reality of content is changed the way in which we all learn. And certainly for students who are fidgetal, learning has fundamentally changed. And we know all of you are, are part of this. The workplace has changed. The dynamics of job creation, the scale of global economy, the dynamics of manufacturing, marketing, how we actually uh, represent businesses and the skills required in this new economy are different. So when you think about education systems trying to transform and trying to change, what we often miss from a mindset shift is recognizing that the three most important elements that schools could hope to change, student mindset, the way in which we learn, and the workplace we're preparing our students for has changed. And how do we build on that? And it's incredibly important to build on because as we see the wave of technology trends that are going to be talked about throughout this conference, and I'll touch on the dynamics of what's potential and the paradigm shifting that will happen with artificial intelligence in the middle, the impact of mixed reality, and certainly the emergence of quantum computing has an opportunity to fundamentally shift and accelerate a lot of the innovation pathway that we've been on uh, for the last decade or so. And so we've got to get our students prepared. We've got to be thoughtful about how we use these technologies. And certainly, we can start with mixed reality. And I'll just touch on, on the dynamics here. And this is not a headset world only. And I think oftentimes we think about mixed reality as it's a sort of a virtual reality headset or some augmented reality technology. We've got to understand deeply the connection technology can have in our physical reality. How can technology make us more assistive? How can it be natural? How can we cr cross barriers with language? The reality is the digital reality that people play, whether it's online, et cetera, needs to be much more blended as well in this new dynamic. So when we think about mixed reality, it's definitely across this spectrum. And as we think and emerge from headset environments, as we think about uh, you know, a virtual reality uh, environment or augmented reality that uses technology naturally in our real world and everywhere in between, the future is going to be fueled with mixed reality activities. Certainly, the classroom has an opportunity to bring immersive connection to content and experiences uh, into uh, the world uh, for students and build on that in terms of what we can create in this spectrum. Now, this is the exciting thing about mixed reality. It's not just, hey, I'm in a virtual world or I'm seeing content differently. It's going to allow us not only to help people who need help with inclusivity, but it's going to allow us to create and make things differently. There's an amazing example in Melbourne, Australia with RMIT, which is uh, a, a university in, in Melbourne, that their school of architecture has actually been using augmented technology and augmented um, um, HoloLens devices to actually build new construction buildings. And as the video plays, you'll get a chance to see how they're using it. And they built software to allow them to do this in their school of architecture. And what's interesting is the students are using uh, an augmented reality device to be able to create different structures, sculptures, buildings, in very different ways. What was interesting about this as I met with the students, what the students shared was these buildings would not be possible without augmented technology because it's impossible to draw or sketch or build architectural maps for these types of buildings. And even if you did, even if you can render a map or design, it's very, very hard for contractors to build in this new way with these new dynamics, these new shapes and dimensions. So what they're using in RMIT to actually make these buildings a real reality is they're taking the render, putting it in an augmented reality headset, and as the, the buildings are welded and constructed, the, con the contractors are actually using augmented reality devices to understand the angles, the wells, the placement of beams and steel. 
And this is opening up an opportunity for creation that wasn't before possible. And this is going to be a huge shift as we think about the education reality, not just seeing the world differently, but doing things differently. Now, as we think about the emergence of AI, and emergence of AI is going to be certainly a topic of conversation. It's something that the world is looking for. Certainly, we know the role AI can play uh, in every industry, in our personal lives, and certainly in the world of education. And as we think about the emergence of AI, it's not different from any other part of history when we have an opportunity to make progress, overcome challenges, whether it's crossing a river or feeding people. Um, how do we use technology, devices, uh, ingenuity to solve big challenges? And we've had that happen in many, many phases throughout the world where we create uh, the printing press or automobiles, et cetera. And as these innovations have happened, there's always been challenges. You know, well, you know, we've got a rise of cars that obviously helps mobilize the population, create new connection, create new industry, create new jobs. It may displace jobs. It may create pollution. There's dynamics around all these technology innovations, and this is absolutely clear as we see the rise of artificial intelligence. It's not something that is actually even um, as obvious or consistent as you would think. We talk with a lot of schools who are working to provide predictive insight of students who are about to fail. This is helpful versus seeing a student get an F on a paper. Wouldn't we use AI and predictive insight to be able to tell a teacher or a parent or a student even if they're at risk of failing? While that may seem like a good thing, there are many, many parents who absolutely don't want that because they don't want that in the mindset not only of their children, they don't want their teacher thinking that their student is at risk of failing. So we have to think about how this new opportunity, uh, this new innovation can help us and be thought practically. Now, one of the things about all the phases of this ingenuity and certainly what's happening in AI, it's driven by data. And this is a reality and this is a journey and I'll talk about this narrative fundamentally as it relates to education, because I, I, I meet with schools and universities who have this problem um, and certainly understand this dynamic. But this is, I think, true in all industries. I look at really four core phases of this data journey. And this is critically important. And you need to understand where your organization is, maybe the elements within your organization are as it relates to this data journey, because a lot of the innovation that's going to be possible is going to be fueled by your evolution across the spectrum. The first phase is the collection phase. Lots of data is being collected in many of your institutions and organizations, certainly in schools. Lots of data, though, is not collected as well. If you have children in, in schools, think about what happens when their student is in school for a year and your their teacher knows what motivates them, they knows what makes them happy, they know the interests that they have outside of school, maybe what they want to be in the future. And they're putting grades into a, a, a sheet that's often what's transferred to their next year teacher. All that nuance, all that insight is often being lost. The data that we are capturing is often siloed, not aligned to systems, not transparent for educators or, or policymakers, et cetera. So we've got to work to say, all this data, we've got to collect the right things. We've got to make sure that it's obvious and transparent to the people using the data and purposeful in that gu guidance. So we move because that data is overwhelming and it's challenging, we know it's important, to display. And the display phase is the dashboard phase of the journey. This is where red, yellow, and green lights become popular. This is where we start to think about, hey, we've got to organize the data to make it meaningful. This is the shortest phase of the journey, and that's partly because once you actually have exposure to the data, once you can see it across your organization or institution, you want to act on it. You don't want to look at historical trends uh, and activities. You want to actually say, I don't want to see things after they happen. I want to understand how to prevent issues. How do I drive for the future? So you use predictive algorithms. You use insight to use the data to actually anticipate, to become more adaptive and predictive. Now, the reality of this phase, it's absolutely important, but it's not the end. We need to use data not only to tell us where to go, but actually go and evolve data to where it actually no longer needs to be core present up front. Because I'm not sure uh, about your institutions, but one of the big challenges that we have with data and a data-driven culture in schools and universities is that teachers and professors 
are not accustomed to actually looking at dashboards before they build a lesson, before they engage with schools. Educators don't have the time or maybe even the interest or maybe the mindset to embrace data and instruction. And increasingly, with the rise of AI, with the rise of connected systems, data will become the fuel of experiences. And this is where AI really becomes magical for classrooms, certainly with your organizations. How do you use the data, the insights that you're collecting, to drive the right experiences, to keep people safe, to save energy, to innovate, to draw the right conclusions and strategy? And so we've got to talk about this role of AI and really what it's doing to fundamentally unlock human ingenuity. And we often think about AI as something that is anti-human, naturally. AI is going to remove jobs. It's going to displace workers. What we've got to do is actually understand how AI can help amplify human potential. We certainly see that reality in classrooms, where we can use personalized learning to connect students to their passions, what motivates them as a student, to make everything that we learn purposeful. And by the way, if you have children in school or if you're an educator or a teacher, the most imp important question every student should ask and we should ask is why are kids learning what they're learning? What are they going to do with what they learn? In a world where answers are on your phone, content is ubiquitous, it's much more important now than ever before to give that purposeful connection. And we can use AI to fuel that human innovation and ingenuity. And let's take a look at some of the ways in which that's happening in all of our lives. Behind every great achievement, every triumph of human progress, you'll find people driven to move the world forward. People finding inspiration where it's least expected. People who lead with their imagination. But in an increasingly complex world, we face new challenges. And sometimes it feels like we've reached our limits. Now, with the help of intelligent technology, we can achieve more. We can access information that empowers us in new ways. We can see things that we didn't see before. And we can stay on top of what matters most. When we have the right tools and AI extends our capabilities, we can tap into even greater potential. Whether it's a life-changing innovation being the hero for the day, making a difference in someone's future, or breaking down barriers to bring people closer together. Intelligent technology helps you to see more, do more, and be more. And when your ingenuity is amplified, you are unstoppable. So it's all about unlocking that potential uh, in people. But I want to give it a, a practical example, and maybe you can also help me participate in this example. And this is a real project. Microsoft is working with the Snow Leopard Trust, which is just a little bit below us outside of Seattle. And they're using the Microsoft Cloud Azure to apply artificial intelligence to the research that they're doing on the Snow Leopard population in Central Asia. And there is a diminishing population of snow leopards on the planet. And the researchers, historically, have gone to uh, Central Asia and set up trap cameras, not uh, unlike the one you see in this photo. And they set these photos up. And typically, three or four times a year, they set these cameras up throughout the habitat. And those, those cameras take photos, hundreds of thousands of photos of snow leopards so they can help uh, do research. Sometimes the photos are nice, beautiful shots like this. But oftentimes, the photos are at night or foggy, et cetera. Sometimes we're not actually seeing what we thought. And by the way, as I talk about this, this is also a metaphor for how data operates in your organization or institution. Sometimes it's very clear. 
Sometimes it's a little bit dark. Maybe you don't understand. Sometimes it's foggy. Sometimes you get unexpected. You get something that may look like a snow leopard, but it actually is not. A lot of times you get really nothing or no clear insight from this data. Sometimes it's hard to see. Now, I'll ask you to play the, the, the role of a snow leopard researcher in, with Snow Leopard Trust. Now, imagine hundreds of thousands of photographs that people have to sort through to find snow leopards. Looking in images like this, is this a snow leopard picture or not? There actually is a snow leopard here. You could see the end of the tail in this pied. How about this one? There's none in there. Maybe this one. Or you got one on the, the left. Maybe here. You see, a, you see a snow leopard right here. Maybe the last one. Very well hidden. A snow leopard staring right at you. Now imagine researchers spending time manually going through hundreds of thousands of images to find snow leopards when we can use the power of pattern matching, recognition of gait, an understanding of the dynamics of by collecting images and getting smarter about finding snow leopards, and do this fairly instantly, and sorting these hundreds of thousands of photos to help the researchers get through the work. This is not fundamentally artificial intelligence, we think. This is really augmenting the intelligence that these researchers are applying to learn more about snow leopards and actually do the real research. This is the shift. This is what we need to embrace as we embrace the potential of AI. Now, let's give you an example in education. This is a, a context that we struggle with in classrooms every day. Educators struggle with, I've got two kids. I want to understand which one is at more risk. Lots of schools are saying, let's bring data to the rescue. Let's bring insight to the rescue. So let's, let me share that example. OK, now we've got these students. Now imagine the system was really, uh, really you know, innovative and pro pro progressive. They're not only thinking about grades, they're thinking about connection to optimism, socialization, really connecting to the social and emotional learning journey that students want. So the educator has a plot of student performance against this grid. You can apply it to math, science, history, et cetera grades. It's very different and difficult to understand which student is at more risk. What does that even mean? The dynamics of what to do. It's very difficult for an educator. That's just two kids. Most teachers have a lot more than two kids. They've got classrooms of kids, schools of kids. So it's not just about data alone. This is going to be true in, in organizations in every industry. It's not just understanding that we can collect data, we can map it. We're going to need to use new technologies to make the connection to data, to understand the opportunities for us to use the data in the experiences that fuel our work. Every digital book that a student has should know who's reading it, should know what motivates them, should know what's on their schedule should understand their challenges and weaknesses. These are the dynamics that we have to bring. That will be powered by the way in which we bring AI to the mix. And that's something that we have to work together on collectively across industry, across vendors to do it. I'll touch a little bit on quantum computing. And quantum computing is certainly the largest and, the, and, the, and certainly the most emerging technology paradigm that's on this list. But it happens to be one of the one, ones that's most fundamental. If we're using data and AI to sort and make data more useful, the power that we can harness with quantum is going to enable us to use that data to solve some of the challenges that are a little bit out of reach for us to solve with the current computing platform. So let's take a look at some of the work that we're doing at Microsoft, some of the work that will emerge, and the impact quantum computing can have on all of us. talk about quantum computing, it's a completely different game. 
Quantum computing will enable us to solve problems that currently take longer than the lifetime of the universe in seconds, hours, or days. We completely reconceive the space in which we do computation. Quantum computing is like going from crawling to going to a different planet. It's different. It's only natural that we would want to use the world's most powerful device to combat the world's most challenging problems. We could attack global warming. Security. What are the boundaries of machine learning? Fighting diseases. The possibilities of quantum computers are endless. Microsoft has the best and the brightest working on this problem. It's really happening. Progress is very fast. And we're building a quantum computer. What the world wants to know is what happens when we turn the machine on. What problems will be solvable with a computer that computes in a billion parallel universes at the same time? So the potential of quantum and certainly mixed reality and AI are huge. One of the challenges that all of you face, certainly the world faces, is finding students to innovate, to build, to create the future with those three technology paradigms is hard. It's impossible for com companies to find the technology staff, the developers, the data scientists, the robotics engineers to drive the connection. And this is the change. And we see this is a tension often between why students are in school and what their role is and what they want to do in their future, the perception of the way in which the system or institutions are driving things um, like curriculum and the testing model that exists in many countries, and the role of educators to harness that pur purposeful learning connection. This is creating a global crisis of skills around the world. And this is true increasingly where the innovation opportunities that countries increasingly do have is not met based on the outcome and the output of institutions. We have this inside of even the, the, the dynamics with what we call STEM or STEAM, which increasingly is a T problem, not an SEM problem. It's understanding the dynamics of technology. In the role of technology, I think in 2015, only 12% of computer science graduates, which is a small population we need a lot more of, 12% of those had exp expertise with cloud computing when that's driving the change of the world. In that population, 10% are women. So we've got a problem inside that T, but increasingly as we think about AI and robotics and quantum computing, mixed reality, the gap is greater. And we've got to work on that. We see it happening with youth unemployment. And certainly Canada is in a good position as it relates to this global dynamic. But as we think about the youth unemployment, we see Canada doing very well globally. But the economic dynamics around education are universal, and that's creating pressure on the system. At Microsoft, we're starting to work with harnessing the power and potential of, our, of, of uh, the role LinkedIn can play with not only getting a student a purposeful connection to learning, but actually harnessing what they're learning and what they need to prepare for the workforce that's changing. We have a project that's going on in India, in Andhra Pradesh in India, to actually drive that work to make it real for students, to give them a connection on why they're in school and how they can prepare for the future, harnessing the power of the LinkedIn graph connected to their education landscape. And let's take a look at Project Sangam in Andhra Pradesh, India. I don't have a qualification. But without goals, if I'm getting a qualification, what I do? I don't know. I don't know. 
కిటన్ బాయింగర్ బుజుంటాను కొంత మంది ఆడ పిల్లలు బయటికి వెళ్ళలేక జస్ట్ ఇంట్లోనే ఉండి జాబ్స్ చేయలేక కాంప్లికేషన్ థింగ్ ఇస్ పర్సన్ డజంట్ హావ్ స్కిల్స్ కంపెనీ వాంటెడ్ స్కిల్ పర్సన్ దేర్స్ ఎ గ్యాప్ దట్స్ ఇట్ జోలి అన్నిషికనే దొరే పత్రతలో ఇంటర్నెట్ కి எல்லாரும் போய் எல்லாரும் యూస్ చేయనుండు ఈ ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్స్ ఒక ఒక టెక్నాలజీ అట్ ఒక ట్యాబ్లెట్ లో ఆకి కిట్టుగానేంగి అది మనకు కూడ వెనిట్ మనసిలాకా పట్టు ఆర్ఎల్ ఫోన్ ద ఫోన్ యూస్ చేయు ఫుల్ టైం జాబ్ ఆపర్చునిటీస్ చెక్ చేయని ఏట నల్ల ఆప్షన్ అన్నది మొబైల్ యూసింగ్ తనేన నేను అత్రే వర్షం పడిసేదలం ఇదెన్ డర్నాస పినే మన సెట్ హెల్ప్ ఫుల్ ఐరికి ఆ సంభవం గిట్టి అన్నాస జీవిక్కన్ what we can make is critical it's critical to inspire students it's critical to unleash the talent that exists everywhere around the planet in every classroom and it's not just helping kids get a job the reality is that's not enough in many cases the youth unemployment is is challenged because there's not enough entrepreneurship and job creation and in this digital industrial revolution that's what we've got to do we've got to inspire students to create jobs building on the skills that are not only going to be necessary in the workplace but going to fuel their passion and their lifelong learning growth and this is the work we've got to do across these we often call these historically the four Cs creativity critical thinking collaboration and communication certainly we understand computational thinking computing has entered that top C and I'll add another C maybe a 6 C and that's character increasingly in the global world that we live in the complex dynamics not only with regards to technology but the implication of ethics around how we use technology understanding how we can have a meaningful world a world connection to helping people around the world live better lives character is going to be essential for students and giving them that growth mindset to overcome obstacles to believe that they can achieve to go into schools expecting a greater future for themselves and their family and they've got to embrace that growth mindset it's what's fueling everything that we do at microsoft and i'm going to close with just an example of applying that growth mindset to a project that started here in vancouver so i'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've done at microsoft with our hackathons and i'm looking forward to in in july i'll be part of many hackathons i have i have a number of ideas and i'm forming teams now Uh, it's a, a an opportunity that every year the company gets teams together across disciplines across talents to build and innovate with ideas that connect to their personal passion how they can use their talents to great work and we had a hackathon team uh led by our engineering team in Vancouver who created a hack called learning tools Now learning tools it started out as an add-in to OneNote. OneNote is a product in Office 365. It's available cross platform, cross devices. It's available for free for students around the world to help kids primarily with dyslexia or dysgraphia learn to read more effectively. What we've learned and that was a, a tremendously noble mission. I'll share a little bit more about it. What we've learned about the work that we do around inclusive technology. It un- unlocks potential for everyone it unlocks understanding of how we use language in this context how do we use our own ai platforms and technologies to make an experience possible for kids we've got to increasingly think about inclusivity in terms of the work that we do and it's driving and fueling innovation across many unexpected disciplines and that's absolutely true what's with what's happening with learning tools now learning tools can take anything text notes that you're taking maybe even a photograph of a piece of paper and not only bring that into a clean easy to read experience but understand languages understand words read back to a student who's struggling to read and the results of this have been incredible 
Students that have struggled to read beyond their grade level are advancing multiple grade levels uh, in a very, very short amount of time. Teachers who have had problems with students who not only have dyslexia or dysgraphia, but maybe have just struggled to read, are unlocking potential and confidence in kids. And let me share a little bit of the Learning Tools story, and you can actually hear the confidence and the shift happening with kids exposed to the tool. The fact that over the summer, that a child can go from basically nothing to having the world at their fingertips and being able to read and being willing to try, it's, it's more than a miracle. I think it's more than anybody can, can expect. Even in kindergarten, Anja was incredibly bright, but he couldn't read. The difficulty reading continued to second grade. Shortly after Anja was diagnosed with dyslexia, a friend of mine said she saw something online about a tool for Microsoft for kids with dyslexia. I made an appointment at our local Microsoft store. We went in, they downloaded learning tools, asked Anja to sit down, and my son read. It was amazing. Anjay, in that moment, conquered this fear and realized that he could access something that had been inaccessible to him. I saw my little boy read and knew that here was an answer, that here was something that could change his life. Microsoft Learning Tools has been a miracle in our lives. He could get everything in the same font. He was able to lengthen his spaces between words. And that was amazing and so simple. Anj has been happier, more confident. He was living his life where the written word was an enemy. And now it's a thing to be conquered. That's a tool it's an amazing tool. It started here in Vancouver as part of our partnership with the Cascadia Innovation Corridor, the work that we're doing together in Canada. That's a tool used all around the world by educators and students. And that speaks to the change that we all need to, meet, to lead. Embracing a growth mindset on how we're gonna apply this innovation that we all have capacity to do. Think about the role technology can have to make the world a better place and to unleash the potential in every amazing kid on the planet. Thanks to the work that all of you do as leaders, as technology innovators, to drive that change, not only for Canada, but for the world. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Microsoft is happy uh, and proud to be a part of it in Canada and globally. And have a great BC Tech Summit. Thank you.